right now, I live in Baldwin, and uh, right now the uh, uh, the initial industrial park that we uh, created in Baldwin uh, was started early uh, 1980s, and and that park uh, got filled up. Uh, there's now a uh, another park that's out on the interstate uh, in Baldwin, and we're trying to fill that one up. But uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how from the from the ground level, uh, you know, we've, we've had Ryan speak a little bit about uh, from the state level and the programs that are available from there. Uh, you know, SHAR's uh, program is one piece of the finance puzzle and finance and money is part of what's necessary uh, to put economic development to, uh, together. Uh, but uh, it happens somewhere. It happens in communities. Uh, there's a lot of communities here in uh, uh, St. Croix County, Pierce County, Dunn County, Polk County, uh, along the border. Uh, all of those people, uh, all those communities have people. Those people need jobs, and uh, they're mobile. It's a mobile workforce. Uh, uh, occasionally, uh, uh, I don't drive the 18 miles or so from Baldwin to New Richmond in the morning. Uh, I drive uh, into the Twin Cities because I'll have something going on in there. And you can go out to 94 south of Baldwin uh, and get on the interstate at about quarter to six in the morning, and it is bumper to bumper traffic heading to the cities. And there is some traffic coming the other direction too, but there is a, this is a mobile workforce. And uh, uh, you know, so there, each, each community in this part of the uh, state has its interest and they want you know, jobs in their community. But as a practical matter, uh, you know, when Polaris uh, closed a few years ago uh, up in Osceola and uh, more recently uh, Ideal Door, uh, uh, Clope in Baldwin, I think their combined there was about 800 jobs. Well, those 800 jobs weren't all in those specific communities of Osceola and Baldwin. Uh, those people were coming to those jobs from Minnesota. They were coming from 30 or 40 miles north. They were coming from 40 or 50 miles to the east. They were coming from 30 or 40 miles to the south. And so, uh, you know, the concept of you know, uh, economic development in our community. Yes, uh, everybody wants economic development, they're a community, but it's gonna come from all over and we're all interrelated and specifically in this part of the state, we're, we're obviously very tied uh, to the Twin Cities area because uh, that's the economic engine that's, that uh, drives things around here. So I wanna talk a little bit uh, and just kind of go through some things I think that, that I've experienced uh, over the years in, in working from economic development not only in our, uh, our represent some representation of municipalities, because we do a lot of municipal work, but also in my private practice uh, with our firm because I have a lot of business clients and that's the bulk of that. And then uh, you know the financial institutions that are related to that as well. So first of all, at the municip municipal level, uh, communities need to think of what their assets are. What is it that we have that's available that's going to attract businesses to our community? Sometimes it's location. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've said being from Baldwin is one of the big assets we have, we're sitting at the intersection of 94 and 63. Transportation is key to a lot of small businesses. We're sitting in the right spot for that. Same thing if you take, you know, Hudson's right there on the 94 corridor. Uh, Roberts, there's the development going on there along the interstate. Baldwin's there. Uh, you get down to Menominee, you get down to Eau Claire. You know, what are the assets? You know, you're on that uh, transportation corridor. Uh, but each of these municipalities, every municipality has some type of uh, governing organization. And the attitude of that uh, board, whether it be the city council, whether it be the village board, whether it be the town board, the attitude of that governing body as to economic development is going to uh, influence how successful they're going to be in attracting businesses to their community. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a sales job. You know, uh, when a business, you know, first of all, businesses don't routinely just pick up and move someplace. That just doesn't happen very often. But what does happen is that they'll expand uh, and, and new startup businesses will happen. So you need to make your community and you have to have a welcoming uh, uh, atmosphere when businesses come to the community because uh, they're gonna come to your community and they're gonna come to the community that's 20 miles down the road and 30 miles the other way. 
they've got a lot of opportunities. And uh, so from the, from the governing body's perspective, you need to be receptive to uh, accepting economic development in your community. And the way that that generally happens is uh, it usually gets to the board or the council kind of more at the end of the process. But where it really happens is in the, you know, the planning commission, uh, uh, those types of things. They're looking for a zoning change for a building. Uh, they're looking for uh, to develop some particular area and they need some zoning issues there. It happens in those committees that meet with those particular prospects when they come to the community. Uh, in larger communities, uh, Hudson, Denny's here, you know, larger communities have their own economic development director. That's a key, key player in putting together things uh, for businesses coming. Uh, they have to have a place to locate. I think just about every community in this part of the state has an industrial park. Uh, so th you have to have the infrastructure there. I remember when uh, the first park that was in Baldwin when it was first developed, uh, the village acquired that property and it had been a farm field, it had been a farm. And, you know, we were trying to get businesses to come to locate in our industrial park. And I don't know if it was just in the spot that we hadn't planted corn that year that we wanted them to be or what. So, you know, you have to then, the community has to make some investment. And, you know, Baldwin spent uh, more than a million dollars in infrastructure. We put in a road, uh, we put the utilities out there, but, you know, that takes engineering. Cedar was around and did that. You know, it, it takes a piece of, you know, and so now at least looked like a park. But, you know, so then we had a road that went between the corn rows, and that still really didn't get the deal done. But then, finally, a business located there. Uh, K-Tech came, they were, they were from the cities, uh, the Griffith family came over. Uh, that was the first business that located in the industrial park, but now it looked like a park. But that didn't happen overnight. I mean, I think uh, the village bought the land, uh, I, it was maybe uh, another year or so before they put together a package between grants and things from the state to build the infrastructure and put that in there. And then it sat. And I want to say it sat for two years with nothing that happened. Nothing. Well, you know, from a governing body when budgets are tight, it's tough, you know, to, you know, to make that effort and make that investment in the future. But eventually, as I say, it said, KTEC did locate there. and. After that, it exploded. It was just like one business a year for the next seven years. And so, uh, and that park filled up, we had no more land. And so, you know, on the front end, you're saying, well, you know, should we really spend this money? And on the back end, you're saying, why did we only do 50 acres? Why didn't we do 100 acres? You know, now we're in trouble. Now we're landlocked. And so, uh, uh, but you have to have a place. And, and just about every community in this part of the state does have an industrial park. The tax incremental financing has helped with a lot of that. Uh, you know, one of the twists about that uh, that's impacted recently because of the economy and real estate values is the way that the TIF financing work is you start out with this base financing of bare land and, and then what you do is to pay for your infrastructure and for the development of the park, you get all the increased revenue for a period of time uh, from the increased taxes that are developed when a business locates there. Well, that works great, but there's been situations now, and I know that there's some legislation that they're trying to look at uh, addressing this as well. You know, we started at this base level. You know, we had some improvements, but the ones that came online late, they started at this base level. We looked for some improvements, even though we had some improvements, but now the property values are taxed, and now we're down below where we actually started out. So the, the financing, uh, the, re the increment of tax revenues that the municipality is relying on to develop that infrastructure that's gone because there's no increment when you got a negative, uh, negative increment. So, but the legislature and there, there are folks that are looking at that. So that's that's good from that perspective. Um, incentives. Uh, uh, I don't want to say there's there's no free lunch because at times there are there is a free lunch. Uh, most of the municipalities we've been involved in over here have actually acquired the property and then put together a package for. Let's say the land's going to be $10,000 an acre, and that's what the price is for everybody. But uh, if you create X number of jobs, you're going to get a credit against that price, and then we work in some of the tax financing for that. We work in some grants, and it turns out that you can get your land for free if you'll locate here. And there's there are variations on that, and uh, different communities do it different ways, but their incentives for people to come to your community. And again, the governing body's got to be willing to take that chance and put together those incentive packages for to do that. 
but communities have assets, and when businesses come to communities and when businesses are looking to expand in communities, they want to know what your assets are. What are your facilities? What are the schools? You know, the Richmond School District's got brand new school buildings. Somerset's got brand new school buildings. Baldwin's got some new buildings. Uh, Hudson's working on getting new buildings. They got some new elementary schools. Uh, they're always looking at that because their schools are overcrowded. Uh, uh, Marion left, but uh, Marion's the administrator of the uh, hus hospital in Hudson, brand new facility out on the on the interstate, and uh, you know uh, the retail uh, establishments, whether there's any culture, any theater, stuff like that, that makes a difference. Uh, different things are important to different people, and the decision makers might have you know different uh, interests, and but it's important if your community has those facilities available. Uh, for the business to attract them to your community. Uh, last thing with the municipalities, you have to have a game plan. Uh, you know, somebody has to be kind of the driving force behind it. And I, you know, Mark will remember this name uh, back in the Woodville days. Uh, I think Woodville probably had one of the earliest developed industrial parks in this part of the state, and in large part by because of a guy named Art Best. Art Best was a broker, real estate guy. He's now deceased. Lived over in Woodville. But he sold Woodville everywhere, and he was the guy that drove development. So in, those, in your community, you need somebody that's like that. My experience has been that a good person for that is a retired business person who had, had been uh, gone through that uh, process of owning a business, retired commercial banker. Uh, those types of people, they have some time on their hands. Uh, you know, they're retired, but they've worked hard all their life. They need something to do. They're the perfect person to connect with, with your, uh, with the governing body to kind of take the lead because then when a business comes to town, you got one contact person, they can kind of take them around, put them in contact with everybody else that, uh, they need to see to make things work. Another player on the team are the financial institutions. And I know we've got folks here from, uh, some of those entities here, but, those, the commercial lenders, they need to be engaged. They need to be receptive when uh, a business shows up to town. It's, you know, they're in the business of uh, renting their money out for folks to use. And uh, uh, there's a lot of benefit to the financial institutions to uh, put packages together. But again, that ends up being a team effort. I think the last Char, uh, screen that Shar had up that showed all the various components for financing and you know, you get some, you know, the owner's got to have some skin in the game, so they've got some money in there. You've got the SB, you've got the banks, uh, credit unions, uh, you've got the, uh, the SBA, you've got the, you know, the regional loan fund, you've got the state programs, and you've got to have somebody that's, again, kind of marshalling that from the community side to kind of know what those programs are, be able to put those pieces together. Uh, Bill sitting in front here, Bill Rubin from St. Croix EDC, Bill is the perfect guy in this particular area. He knows those programs. He knows those people. He's able to uh, work, and he works across the area. Steve Healy's up. Well, Steve's here, too. I didn't look down the other side of the row. But, I mean, he's another guy. Those uh, area-wide, county-wide economic development directors know what those programs are. And so from a local community level, you want to stay in contact with those folks because they can put you in connection with the folks at WEDC, put you in connection with Shar, and, and make those connections. Seth uh, Hudson, who's the local guy here for WEDC, all of those people are key to putting those uh, uh, packages together. And financing, it's necessary for a business to expand, for a business to relocate. It takes money, and uh, uh, those financial packages need to get put together. Uh, Shift gears a little bit. Uh, there's different, uh, from the professional side of it, uh, there's different people that need to be involved to make these deals work. Uh, you know, uh, folks from Cedar are here, consulting engineers. Uh, they, you know, you need to get your industrial park laid out. It has to have roads. Uh, it has to have sewer and water. It needs electrical. Uh, all of those things get together. Those folks have uh, grant writers. Uh, they have, you know, they got surveyors, they got engineers, they got architects, they got all of that stuff, and p all of those things are part of what a business needs when it's expanding or when it, whether it's relocating. Uh, accountants, you know, my theory is, uh, I, as I say, I do a lot of business work, and I, I have a, a fairly simple theory on how business works. Uh, whatever it is you've got and whatever it is that you're selling, whether it's a product uh, uh, or a service, you need two things. You need somebody that's able to sell that product because you can have the greatest product in the world, but if you don't have somebody to sell it, uh, it doesn't matter because nobody's going to know about it. 
Uh, the other thing you have to have is you have to have somebody to watch the numbers because if you can sell that product and everyone you sell is at a loss, sorry, you're out of business. On the other hand, uh, if you've got somebody that's a great bean counter, but there's nothing to count because there's no revenue coming in because the sales guys haven't done anything, well, it doesn't work. So you got to have somebody on the number side of it. You've got to have somebody on the sales side of it. If you don't, you visit with uh, the now retired uh, Judge Utchig over at the bankruptcy court in Eau Claire, and uh, you're out and you start over. So a lot of times in small businesses, both of those components are in one person. The owner has wears both of those hats, maybe out of need for necessity. But what's important from a business perspective for the owner is to know whether, in fact, they have both of those skills. And if they do, that's great. But if they don't, whichever skill they don't have, they need to find somebody else to supplement and uh, fill that part. Um, Businesses, financial consultants, uh, you know, uh, a lot for the community side of it, um, a firm that's done a lot of work around here, Ellers from the Twin Cities, you need to have somebody that works on those financial packages for the communities uh, to set up your TIF funding, to set up uh, uh, bonding for doing some of the infrastructure and doing those loans. You've got to have those people, uh, the planners and the grant writers. You know, there's money available. I mean, uh, uh, there's money that's available from state and federal sources, but somebody's got to write the application and then somebody's got to administer it on the back end once the money uh, comes in because it's successful. Other than those folks in, in the core, then you've also got the development pro professionals. So you've got, you know, the larger communities in this area, Hudson, Richmond, River Falls, they have economic development people on staff. The larger communities, you know, they've got the engineers, they've got those types of things on staff. But uh, you start at the local level with those folks in the communities, you go to the county level, you've got your county economic development uh, folks, and then you get to the regional level where in this particular area, it's Momentum West and different, different areas of the state. Uh, it has, uh, they have different names, but again, regional, regional organizations, and then finally get to the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation up at the state level. But again, all of those things need to work as a team, you know, going from the local level up to the state level, and then from the state level back, back down. Once you have all those components, you've got the municipality, uh, you've got the, uh, you've put the infrastructure in place, you've got some financing, all of those things, that just doesn't just kind of fall out of the sky and happen. There has to be a game plan. Somebody needs to be the driving force uh, behind that. Uh, you've got to, as I, as I say in here, you've got to have the coach or the deal maker. And in different communities, it's different people. Um, you know, it can be the banker, it can be the accountant, it can be the lawyer, sometimes it's the engineer, but it has to be somebody. Somebody's got to kind of coordinate all of these pieces uh, because as, you know, Ryan's heard down at WEDC and, and you hear that comment often, well, you know, they run me around to 47 different people and somebody doesn't, you need one warm body that's really willing to, you know, drive the deal, pay attention to it, and have that be the priority on their particular uh, list of things to do. So all of those components need to come together. When it, when it works, it's great. You know, a new business locates in your community, uh, it creates a lot of jobs, it creates a lot of excitement. And, you know, and that, you know, it drives the economy, which pays the taxes, that pays for the schools, that does the education stuff that, uh, that Mark needs. But it takes a concerted effort on the part of a lot of people, and it takes a lot of pieces to put that together. And, uh, and, and maybe why I'm so kind of passionate about putting all that stuff together is because I've seen uh, communities lose opportunities when it's because of, this polit political issue or that political issue or this particular indi uh, individual person's, you know, bent on things that have scared away deals that easily could have been put together and could easily happen. And I can tell you, having dealt with a lot of communities, you know, there are just some communities that are more receptive to business development than others. And you wouldn't think that. You'd think they'd all be eager for it. But sometimes people just put up roadblocks for whatever reason and, uh, you know, and, and I, because I'm on both sides of that fence, both on representing municipalities and representing the businesses that want to locate there, I see that. And so what I would say to you folks who are going to go out and be part of that process in various roles is try to be a deal maker as opposed to a deal breaker. And that doesn't mean that everybody gets everything that they want. In fact, generally, if everybody doesn't quite get everything they want, that's when you get a deal. And that's when you get things put together. And for me, that's the fun part of it, is putting the pieces together and make the things, uh, make the things happen. So uh, the last thing that I've got on my presentation is I, I put in here, and, and I'm not going to really go through that in detail, but 
once once you get all those pieces put together, and generally you're going to have to have some deals. You know, when uh, when I go to the banker and I want some money, I got to sign some paperwork that says I'm going to pay it back. My handshake isn't going to be good enough, although that's important. Uh, they 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 look at that when they're going to loan you some money, but you have to put some paperwork to get it done. And communities take a risk uh, when they put that infrastructure. You know, it's it's not cheap uh, to put roads and utilities and that. You know, and so you need the company. Uh, you need the owners of the company to be on the dotted line, and you need to be able to hold them accountable uh, going forward. And on the other hand, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. But the, you know, we did away with debtor's prison a long time ago. And the the good thing about uh, you know our economy and the way things work here in this country is people are encouraged to take financial risk. Uh, you know, Mark. He took a financial risk when he started his company. A lot of people, anybody that's starting a new business, that's starting it from scratch at nothing, uh, they take a financial risk. And sometimes they don't work out. But hopefully for those folks, they learn something. And I think, uh, you know, you can read the bios of some of the successful business people in this country. And, you know, a lot of them have gone bankrupt before they made it. And so uh, I think the thing to keep in mind is, is that is what's important is to take the risk and uh, make that effort. So.